something to kind of put uh, put in the you know put in uh, the book of Genesis so that when we jump back you won't have to uh, keep jumping back like uh, like crazy. So uh, just prepare. We're going to be in Genesis and then we're going to be in Ephesians. So if you want to turn to Genesis first in chapter two and then we're going to be in Ephesians chapter five and we're just going to kind of uh, go back and forth a little bit there. And, uh, and uh, we're going we're gonna to visit a few other passages of Scripture as well. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, this is just kind of a, a personal journey of mine that I'm uh, uh, going down. And I, I, uh, I thought I'd share it with the church because you are the church. And so we're going to look at it, all right? So let's look at verse 18 here. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called them, and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And when I say a help meet, what I mean is help meet for him. All right, so that means a, a help that's Appropriate. That's efficient. That's what what he needs. All right. So and, and help. That's meet. That that meets his needs. Okay. So uh, found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took out took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of the man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and, and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Okay, so, uh, so this is part three of the great church, all right? What makes a great church? And uh, I want us to just consider some things here. Let's pray first. Lord, I do ask that you would just uh, guide and direct in, in what I say. Lord, sometimes I... I uh, uh, I get a little ahead of myself and forget to even talk to you about this. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would just speak to our hearts right now as we look into the mystery of your church. And truly, it is a mystery. And I just ask that you would help us to consider the things that we find within your word. And Lord, we pray that they would speak to our hearts and help us, Lord, to, uh, to be revitalized as far as the meaning of of that institution, that, or that organism that we're a part of. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so the first thing that I want us to consider is, and uh, there, there, I, have, I, have about a, I have a couple points here. Believe it or not, I actually have something, I have quite an alliteration. Would you believe that? An alliterated outline. Uh, so we're going to look at the symphony of the people, all right? And uh, I guess I could have said the symphony of the persons, the source of the product, the secret of our potential, and then the security of the plan. And so that, those are things that we're going to be considering today as far as uh, what we're going to be looking at. Um, but the symphony of the people, what do I mean by that? Okay, there is an amazing, uh, there, there's, a there's an amazing oneness with Christ and his church, his unity. And we see that with uh, Adam and Eve. And so Adam and Eve would be Symbolic of Jesus Christ and his church. And of course, the marriage in Ephesians chapter 5 is symbolic of the church. And so hold your place. All right, so here we are. Uh, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and leap over to Ephesians now. Uh, so hold your place here and go to Ephesians 5. And let's look at verse 25. All right, we're going to look at uh, something that's uh, uh, what the church is and what the church will be. All right. So as far as the symphony, all right, when I say symphony, what I mean is everything works together, all right? Now when I say symphony, a symphony, an orchestra would be a basically all violence, okay? Um, uh, that would, you know, if you're, if you're any kind of an of a, a instrumentalist, you know that an orchestra would be just violins. A symphony would be a whole bunch of different instruments working together, all right? So the man and the woman are certainly two very different uh, entities, however, they, they both make a unit. There's a symphony there. 
The church is very different from the Lord Jesus, but yet there's a symphony going on between those two. And uh, so I want us to just consider what the church is at present and what the church will be in the future. And we're going to look at it in the tenses in this verse in Ephesians. Okay, look at verse 25, first of all. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay, what we see, first of all, is the past is the purpose. Okay, the past is the purpose for the church. Okay, what do I mean by the past being the purpose of the church? Christ needed a bride. That's what the past is all about, all right? The past of the, the all right, he loved the church and he gave himself for it. We see the, the sleeping of Adam and the rib being taken out of Adam. And of course, I talked about the bones not being broken within the Lord Jesus Christ the last time and uh, that the bone, the, the rib being a bone is symbolic of the church and you know, once we are in the body of Christ, once we, once we believed in Jesus Christ, we're always going to be a part of that body. You don't ever, you don't ever have to worry about losing your salvation there. So, uh, but, uh, but anyway, so, um, so that is, I want you to notice that it says he loved the church, all right, and gave himself for it so that he might have a bride, okay? Uh, so that he might uh, have that bride. Um, and then uh, uh, I, I want you to just, uh, hold your place here. Like I said, we're going to be jumping back and forth, all right? So hold your place here. I want to look at uh, verse 18 of chapter 2 again, okay? And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him, all right? So it's not good that Jesus is alone. Jesus has the church, all right? The church would be his bride. And so that was the initial purpose. Now, the, the whole marriage between Adam and Eve that happened before the fall. There was a there was an initial uh, there was an initial task at hand, and only the man and the woman would be able to do it before the fall. Imagine that. And uh, we're going to look at that. Uh, it, it really is uh, kind of a, a funny thing to consider. But uh, but that would be the past tense. He loved the church. All right. So that past tense part means that he. He, he, he wanted a bride, all right? Um, now, that's, all right, the past is the purpose. Now, I want to help you to understand that the, uh, the bride, we are not yet the bride. That's when, that's, during, that's, when we, that's when we actually experience the wedding, all right? We are, we are betrothed, all right? We are the bride of Christ, so to speak, that we're going to actually... We're going to participate in the wedding, all right? But right now, present tense, we are called his body, all right? So the first sub point here in this message here, I'm, and I'm going somewhere, believe me, you're going to make, it's going to make sense in just a minute. But the, the past is the purpose, all right? He needed a bride, all right? The present is the position, all right? We are his body, okay? Just like Eve was a part of Adam's body, the present tense would represent the the position that we are, okay, in Christ. Now go back, all right, hold your, hold your place here in Genesis. Go back to Ephesians, all right? <laughs> so like I said, we're going to be jumping back and forth, okay? So, um, all right, um, let, me, let, me, let me see here, okay. Look at verse 23, all right? Look what it says in verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Okay, so we saw love to the church. The purpose was, the, all right, the past is the purpose. All right, that's, that's, he wanted a bride. All right, we're waiting for that day when we're, when we experience the marriage supper of the lamb. What a great day that's going to be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. All right, that's going to be our wedding day. All right, but that's not quite yet. All right, right now we're, right now we symbolize at the present moment the body of Christ, all right? That's the position. Um, uh, our duty at this time in the, church, in the church's life is to manifest the life of Jesus Christ as his body, all right? Uh, to bring him honor in this world, all right? We're supposed to represent him to the best of our ability uh, in this world. It's during this time 
that we're being fashioned to be the bride that we uh, that we're being sanctified and cleansed and prepared for. So let's look at, let's look at uh, Ephesians five here. All right, um, look look what he says. All right, look what he says right here in uh, verse twenty six. All right, um, actually look at verse twenty five. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Why? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. All right, so there it is. We, he's sanctifying and cleansing it so that, he can, so, that he can, uh, uh, so that he can present it to himself. The wedding day, a glorious church. The bride is coming down the aisle, okay? God is going to bring the bride to Jesus Christ. But for right now, we represent his body, okay? Uh, which is really the big reason why uh, betrothal and marriage is, is such a different concept as in other, other uh, you know, uh, among other people. And uh, the Jews practice betrothal. We don't do betrothal, all right? Once you're betrothed, you pretty much are, you, they pretty much consider that being married in, uh, in, in, as a Jewish custom. Um, now, hold your place here and in Genesis, and I want you to look at, um, I want you to look at Esther, just to kind of show you a little bit about what I'm talking about here as far as sanctifying and cleansing, and to help you to see that God is preparing us for the wedding day, all right? In Esther chapter 2, and if, you, if you're not familiar with it, you can't get there, that's fine, just, you can just listen Okay, um, but we're gonna uh, we're gonna look at this verse here in verse twelve. All right. Now, when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that she had been twelve months, according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purification accomplished, to wit, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors and with other things for the purifying of the women. All right. So basically, they were getting they were getting these women ready to be a bride. All right, so uh, all of these things are what they did to present them before the king. All right, so that's really what you're seeing in Ephesians, sanctifying and cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. We are being sanctified. We're being cleansed. We're being, uh, uh, we're being made his helper. We're, we're being prepared. Uh, I'm going to touch on this point a little bit more, but it's interesting that we are a helper, um, uh, case in point, the, the church really hasn't even begun the greatest ministry. I mean, right now we're representing his body. We're proving to the world that he's still alive through us because we represent his body. That's present tense. But our ministry as his help meet hasn't even gotten started. Imagine that. That, that to me is just absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, we're about to discover what Eve's purpose was before the fall, okay? Uh, in the very same breath as men, the real question is, are we really, and, and now, now ladies, don't take offense at this, all right, but are we really employing our wives, our spouses as helps meet for our purpose for being here as God intended? Here's the thing. Before the fall, there were no dishes, there were no children, all right? Now, I realize that he said be fruitful and multiply before the fall, and I'm sure that they would have had kids. Had there not been a fall, they would have had kids, things like that, I understand that. But at this particular time, he said, I will make him, I will make him help meet for him. The church is a mystery, and really, so is the bride, so is the wife, so is the marriage, it's a mystery. He said, I speak concerning Christ and the church. There were no clothes to wash. You look at the very end of uh, Genesis chapter 2, the very last verse, it says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and we're not ashamed, right? No, no clothes being washed, all right? So what was the point? What did, what did, what did Adam need from his wife? Well, that's, that's the big question. Um, I want us to look back at Ephesians 5.22. Um, Again, hold your place in, in uh, Genesis again, all right? Um, I want to look what it says, all right? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. 
For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Okay, now, we just saw the role of the present church, not as the bride, but as the body, all right? And notice it's addressed to wives. It's not addressed to men, okay? It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So basically, men, you can put your finger right over that and you can just kind of go on down to where your job role is. All right, now, here's the thing. Uh, there's nowhere in our job description as husbands to monitor our wife's behavior. That's between them and the Lord. All right, but as far as, as far as our job is concerned, we are to love our wives. We're to per, we are to perform the role of what, uh, uh, the, perform the role and get our wives involved and work as a unit, as a symphony, as husbands, the way that God is planning for his future bride. Now, how in the world do we do that? That's where the Holy Spirit comes into a marriage. That's where God's direction and leading between a man and a wife must be a part of it. That's why, that's why it's not a good idea for pastors to marry unsafe people. Because there's a, there's a part to that whole picture that doesn't even, it doesn't even fit. It's, it's not even proper. All right, so we looked at the symphony of the people, the persons, okay? Um, how that they work together. Present tense. Present tense, where we represent the body of Christ. We represent that he lives. We show the world, we manifest to the world that Jesus is alive. But in the future, we are going to be joined with him, to become one with him, and we are going to be his bride. That's, that's absolutely beautiful. Uh, now, I want to look at the source of the product, all right? The source of the product, what we produce as a church right now, Okay. Uh, look back with me again. I told you we'd be jumping back and forth, all right? Genesis chapter 2, and I want to look at verse 18 again, all right? And we're going to read it, and I want you to notice something, all right? I want you, I want you to underline a couple <coughs> words. If you're in the habit of marking in your Bible, you don't have to, okay? All right, look what it says in verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, of the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam. All right, I want you to underline that word brought if, you, if you're in the habit of marking in your Bibles, okay? Unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found in help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman. And underline that word again. Brought. There it is again. Brought her unto the man. Okay. And then he said, now I want you to notice that Adam says, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Meaning that there is a com there's a compatibility there. So God brought and God brought. What's the difference, okay? It's all about compatibility. Eve, God brought Eve after Eve came out of Adam's body. All right? It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture, but you have to have your heart and mind open to it, okay? It's a beautiful picture because Eve was taken out of Adam's body. He, she came from Adam, and then God brought her to Adam. It's beautiful, all right? So right now, we're, we have been taken out of the body, and God is preparing us as a bride adorned for her husband, and then God is going to walk us down the aisle and present us to his son. Just beautiful, lovely picture. I love it. Um, but what's the difference? Compatibility. You couldn't be married to a cow. <laughs> All right? It's not compatible. Uh, you know, the, the thing is, is you, you can't get offended if God says that's not good enough. 
Your works, the things that you do, they're not good enough. Don't be offended by that. It's just not compatible. The things, your abilities, your talents, who you are, that's from the world. That's not compatible. It's not from heaven. I'm going to get into that right now, okay? The secret of our potential, okay? So we looked at uh, the symphony of the people, the source of the product, and now we're going to look at the secret of our potential as a church, the secret of our potential. Uh, let's now hold your place here again. Ephesians and Genesis, and I want you to turn to John, all right? I told you we'd, uh, we'd be turning to a few other passages here and there in the middle of this, uh, this message here, okay? John chapter 6, or, I'm sorry, John chapter 3, and I want to look at verse 6, okay? Look what it says. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, all right? Now, he said, you must be born again. And you were born the first time, but you were born in the flesh. You were born in this world. You were born with talents. You were born with abilities. Those people who are called with the gift, they, with the ability to preach, with the ability to speak, they were given those abilities to speak. Their, their, you know, the, the, the talents that they had, things like that. I mean, all of those things. You, you've seen people in this world speak effectively. The fact that I have a message that is alliterated, people in the world can do that. So those are things that are of this world. That's being born the first time. The second time, it has to be born of the Spirit. All that you are when it comes to serving the Lord Jesus Christ as a part of the body of Christ must come from heaven. It must come from the Lord Jesus Christ. It must come from His rib. This is now bone of my bone. Flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of the man. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Flesh is flesh is God brought cows, birds, horses, all this other stuff to Adam. All right, but that was flesh and spirit. It's not compatible. There was not a help meet found for him. Nowhere in this world could, could, could Adam find someone that would help him. And so God put him to sleep. All right, Jesus, the Bible says now that he, it says he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Now that he, and then he says, and then he said he ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. All right, because he was, because he was, he, he died and was raised again to newness of life, to, 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 to be seated on the right hand of God the Father. Now we are, we have the opportunity to be born again into his family. And everything that we are that's going to bring pleasure to Him has to be of the Spirit. That's the secret of our potential. Um, our, our abilities are excluded entirely. Oh, Pastor, I can't. I can't preach. I can't teach. I'm not a very good witness. I don't pray very well. I'm a little bit shy when it comes to this. Can I tell you something? Low self-esteem or arrogance, high self-esteem... Both of them still come from self and not from heaven. So whether, you're, whether you feel like you're just not a very good soul winner or you feel like I can win the world to Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what the problem is, it's still self. It has to come from the rib. It has to come from Adam. It has to come from the, the last Adam, if you get what I'm saying. Um... They're both self-centered, all right? So uh, whether your idea is I can't do this or I can do this, it doesn't matter. It's still not from Jesus. Well, what about Paul? Paul would agree with me. Paul would agree with me. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, all right? Keep your place in those other spots, all right? I might have you turn there again. But 1 Corinthians, all right? See, this is how I look at it, all right? Uh, you know, we're, I'm getting ready to have Harrison preach. I'm getting ready to have Josh preach, all right? Here's the thing. Uh, I, I look at Josh, you know, I, I look at, you know, I, when I look at him and I say, you know, we're, we're getting him ready to preach up here, I'm looking at what he has to say up here as nothing as far as experience. Experience, whether he's experienced, he hasn't preached as much as I have and all that stuff, that's, that's all of the world. We're depending on what Jesus Christ does and not ourselves. It has nothing to do with how little he's preached and how much more I preached. That's a very bad view of things. 
It has everything to do with who's using us. It has everything to do with, is he coming up here in Josh's strength, or is he coming up here in the strength of the Lord? And it's his choice. He can depend on the Lord, or he can depend on Josh. And see, here's the thing. It's not going to go well if he's depending on Josh, all right? That's, you know, and, and, and so that's, you know, all right, let, let's look at 1 Corinthians here. Or Harrison, for that matter. Oh, um, all right. <laughs> it's an old Bible. Sometimes it gets a little bit stubborn. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. All right, look what it says in verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling in my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Paul is saying, you know what? You look at me as a Hebrew, you know, you, you think of me as a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee, one of the, you know, a Benjamite, a great man of God. No, I'm coming to you in fear and much trembling. I'd much rather come that way because that which is gained to me, I count lost for Christ, is what he's saying. All right, so he's depending on the things that come from heaven and not of himself. All right, turn to 2 Corinthians here. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 12, this is, what's, uh, this is what's amazing. I used to always wonder, why heaven? Why did God allow Paul to be able to go to heaven? And now there's books written about people taking trips to heaven and all this stuff, and they always base it on Paul taking a visit to heaven. Well, what was the purpose of this, all right? Um, well, look, look what he says in, in verse 9, all right? Second, I'm sorry, I'm sitting here, I'm in 1 Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 12, all right? Look what it says in verse 9 here. According, we, we could probably quote this. And he said unto me, My grace, this is God speaking to Paul, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. All right, now, this was after Paul awoke. I guess it was, I don't know when this was. Paul won't even claim that it was him. He says, there, I knew a man so many years back, in the body, out of the body, I don't know. So he's basically not even claiming it. He's just, he's that humble about things. I think personally this is when Paul got stoned and uh, they were all having a wake for him and he's laying there, I guess, dead in the pit and all of a sudden he just kind of crawls out and says, let's go back to work, <laughs> all right? I think that this is that moment, all right? But he was caught up to the third heaven and he saw amazing things, heard amazing things. Do you know what I think Paul got to see when he went to heaven? I think God said, Paul, all those abilities you have down there at earth, none of that's up here. And I think that's why he was given the thorn in his flesh. I think God was teaching Paul, I don't want your abilities down there. I want everything you have to be straight from heaven. Holy Spirit, power. I can't use the things that are of this world. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is, is, not, is not in him. For, for, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father but it's of the world. It's something completely apart from this world. If we can show our kids the real power of God, they'll never leave it because it's not of this world. Oh, all right, so, uh, you know, we, he, he went to heaven, he saw the place where good comes from, and anything of this world, including our efforts and abilities, is not good. Um, you know, it, it, it's just as worthless as a cow being an eligible Bachelorette for Adam. <laughs> it's that worthless. You get what I'm trying to say? It wouldn't have helped him. He had to find a wife that came from himself. Our deeds are just like those animals that were brought to Adam. God brought all these different animals to Adam and said, is this going to work for you? No, that's not going to work for me. How about this monkey? No. How about this bird? No. There's nothing. Nothing of this world is going to fit what will aid the ministry of Jesus Christ except that which comes from heaven, that which comes from Jesus Christ. That's why it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I told you you'd like this. Anyway, but uh, this, is, look, this is why Paul says what he says in Philippians chapter 3, all right? I want you to turn there. Philippians chapter 3. First, he shows us his impressive resume, all right? This is, this is amazing. 
Philippians chapter 3. He has an impressive resume. If, I, if, if, if anybody would hire Paul, if they saw his resume in Israel, anybody, Paul could have been the prime minister of Israel if he were alive today. He was an amazing man. Anybody would have loved for Paul to lead them. He was impressive. But now look what he says, all right? Philippians 3 and verse 7. But what things were gained to me? Anything that would beat Prime Minister Bennett, all right, was lost for Christ. That's what he's saying. Any abilities that I have, those I count lost for Christ. Look at verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things. And he's talking about this resume at the beginning. Look what it says at the beginning here, okay? Uh, he says, uh, uh, verse 5, here's the resume. Here's, here's where it starts. I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. Wow, that's impressive. I know we don't understand it, but if you were a Jew, you would be like, wow, this is amazing. And Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, by the way, if you can speak Irish, you're called the Irish of the Irish. In Israel, if you are a Benjamite, you're a Hebrew of the Hebrews. You see what I'm saying? Look at verse 6. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That's his resume. Impressive. Everybody's looking, what family did you come from? in Israel. But whatever things were gained to me, those I kind of lost for Christ. Look what it says in verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That means everything that I am in serving the Lord in his church, I am depending on Jesus Christ to do it and not on my own strength. I am depending that whatever I do comes from the side of Christ and not anything that I was in this world, okay? Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Anything, any abilities, any talents, anything that you can be proud of on your own, any discontentments, any low self-esteem, any shyness, Anything that you feel like is, it, you could never serve the Lord with, let it all die. And take up the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's faith. That's the Holy Spirit's power. Can you speak? Can you not speak? Let it die. And say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Whatever that means. I may not be able to speak, but if you want me to speak, it'll be from you and not from me. I can speak, but if you'd rather me not be a preacher, it'll be from you and not from me. It has to be from the rib of Adam, if you get what I'm saying. Okay. Um, look what it says, verse 11. If, I, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. All right, so that's, that is, that's the secret of our potential. It's not about, you know, you know, you look at some of the abilities that people have in churches and things like that, they don't get it. I had somebody tell me this one time. I, I, I was telling them, I said, uh, I, said I, I said, do you think that what you have here would benefit uh, you know, a church like mine? And, and the young man looked at me and he turned around and he held his arms out to this huge orchestra that was at their church. They had worked hard to put this orchestra together. I mean, they had done everything. And he said, he said, without all of this, he said, Tarboro would, he, he, he said, he, he said, without, without all of this, we wouldn't have what we have here. No, it wouldn't work in Tarboro. And I was absolutely astounded by what he said because see, what he's saying is, is everything that I've ever put together here, that's what's allowing the Holy Spirit to work. God looks at that and he says, it's dunk. It's only from what I have. I, I believe in beautiful music. I really do. I believe in worshiping the Lord and I believe in worshiping the way that the Holy Spirit leads. I believe that if the Holy Spirit wants you to have a banjo in the church, then you need to have a banjo in the church. If the Lord wants you to have an orchestra in the church, then you need to have an orchestra in the church. But if it's not from heaven, it's dunk. It's worthless. There's no point. So finally, 
before we close here, we're going to look at the security of the plan. This is, this is just gorgeous. All right, look at Ephesians. And you don't have to hold your place in the other spots anymore. We're not going to go there. But Ephesians chapter 1. You say, Pastor Mike, where in the world do you get the idea that right now we're the manifestation of his body, of his life, but in the future our job hasn't even begun yet? What do you mean? I thought we were going to live in peace and harmony and happiness for all eternity. Oh, I believe all that's going to be there. But I still believe that our work is just getting started just like the way God intended for Adam and Eve before the fall. What's that look like? I believe that we're going to see what that looked like in the life that we live with our future bridegroom. Really, it's going to be beautiful. So let's look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, okay? Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for making himself of twain... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm in chapter, verse 2. Chapter 2. Verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 15. I'm so sorry. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's praying for the church here, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, if you're in the habit of marking your Bibles, underline this, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, verse 23, which is his body. Which means we're going to have a part in the ages to come. There's going to be a ministry that we're going to be doing with the bridegroom. Uh, which is by the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Look what it says in verse uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And you. By the way, if you see that hath he quickened, it's an ellipsis in, in, um, in, in the King James Bible. That means that they put it there for clarity, but it doesn't have to be there. I'm not saying mark it out, but it doesn't have to be there. So it says, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins. That means... He did the same thing with Jesus Christ. He did the same thing with you that he did for Jesus Christ. Far above all principality and power, might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and you, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, that's the cows, the birds, those are the things that came by Adam and Adam, so this ain't gonna work. That kind of thing. Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath, he, hath quickened us together with Christ. All right, there's the, the bone, the rib, all right? And hath raised us up for by grace, I'm sorry. And hath raised us up, let's see here. Um, even when we were, okay, quicken us together with Christ, by grace shall you say, verse 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together. That's me and Jesus. That's the church and Jesus. You get what I'm saying? All right, now. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together. Why? Because we're married. Made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look what it says right now. That's actually happened, right? That's, that's happened. That, that's present tense now. That's where we get the source of our power. But look what it says. Here is our ministry for the future. Look what it says. That in the ages to come. Ages later. All right. 
that in the ages to come he might show what is the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Folks, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that the world is dying to see this happen. It says that they're waiting for the redemption to wit the redemption of our bodies. They are waiting for that unity between Christ and his church at last. I can't explain what God's got for us for all eternity, but I can tell you this, it's going to be awesome. And we need to prepare as his body to be his bride by his power. So that when God brings us to him, Jesus will see us and say, now this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for...